Uh, in this recently published book, there's one poem in which he speaks of working in the field, picking corn in the beat, until fingers and hands go numb. At the end of the day, the work Water bubbled up on the backs of our hands. And then we took off our straw hats and pushed our heads into the cold flow. And then we drank. It made our eyes throb in their sockets and left behind a tang of iron. There were always a few grains of sand. transparent element held in a transparent image, but so carefully noted the transparency retains that minute grip of the earth that is also given. It is for me an image that suggests something rather basic in Chuck's work, something I respond to in his work, a willingness to be transparent without giving up that irreducible grit of experience that leads to everything. One of the difficulties, after all, with dealing with poetry in the classroom is that we're led almost against our will toward an increasing consciousness of all that is artisan in art, when in fact what we most desire is a condition in which artifice disappears as if it were possible in a poem to speak in such a way that what we call art would simply be nothing other than the common currency of our daily lives as we tell each other what it means to be human. Speak is the gain of being human. These are lines from another chunk of poem. And I think that his own urge to make poems speak, moves always toward resting from experience, some gain in being human. But the very subject matter of his poems turns exactly on the ways we try to fashion from our common predicaments more and more of what it means to be human. In our own time, for many of us, there are few guides even fewer certainties to lean on. One possibility is clear, forthright language, a clear colloquial music held in the sentence, and a stubbornly empirical poetry that without erecting a system of belief or myth, speaks out of anger or humor or tenderness or most commonly bafflement, a voice that finally says, I've come this far on two blind wings and no prayer, but it feels natural, it works, and I'm not where I once was. Oh, thank you. Thank Mostly newer things, but I thought I would read two poems from Stars. One a narrative and one a lyric, because I've always flopped back and forth between those two. Pretty much 50-50. Maybe a little more toward the lyric now, but uh, first I'll read the narrative, which it takes place at a cabin my parents used to own on a lovely lake in it's about one of those little victories you can have. It doesn't take much effort and it feels great. Walking is so 
door toward me is the farmer from across the road, a man with seven teeth and 40 acres gone to weed. The bib of his overall supports a belly bloated by Pilsner and boiled potatoes. Each 50 paces or so, he baits and sets a steel trap, tells me he's after muskrats, says these days their pelts ain't worth a nickel in a whorehouse, but the varmints ruin the shoreline with their nests. This is a man who owns things, his body, his mind, a lake and every foot of its shore, and if a woodpecker breaks through his sleep at dawn, a little jolt of birdshot will wipe it away, clean as a fog of breath, leaving his shading there. After he's rounded the point, I get the broom from the cabin. Beginning where he began, I touch the broomstick to the baited tongue in each trap. A loud clack moves over the water, a satisfying sound, a life saved, a whole shoreline gone to hell. <laughs> and then this little lyric is called Nautilus, and it's about the shell, not the submarine. The sea has written a story on the shell in lines of brown ink. The characters turn inward and then vanish in a darkened chamber. Hold it to your ear and you hear only one long breath. To know how the tale ends, you'd have to smash the shell on a rock. It must be read like the story of a man with no desire for an ending. Then some poems from a book called Calling the Dead. This one's called My Oldest Companion, a poem about guilt. I grew up as a Methodist. <laughs> That's what Methodists do best. Feel guilty. You, you wake up in the middle of the night and you remember a conversation you had 12 years ago and you say, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> My oldest companion. A jay complains from the ash tree so unforgiving, his voice makes my whole body feel the way my thumb feels when I draw it along a knife blade, testing the edge. I've done something wrong. It doesn't matter what. Let me just say it was wrong enough to make someone sob and sit out a whole day of anger watching nothing out a window. Our friend, the Jay, bobs his head, aims his beak at my chest as if to warn me he could with little trouble fly right through my heart. I'd throw a stone at the bastard, but if I hit him, I might feel bad. <clears throat> Who wants to haul that weight? Sometimes I think guilt must be my oldest companion. If only I could be a cause without an effect. If only I could throw this stone. This poem uh, is, revolves around the fantasy that as a writer you have some effect on the world called to be a danger. Just once I'd like to be a danger to something in this world, be hunted by cops and forced into hiding in the mountains since if they left me on the streets I'd turn the country around, changing everyone's mind with a word. But I've lived so long a quiet life in a world I've made small that even my own mind changes slowly. I'm a danger only to myself, like the daydreaming night watchman smoking his cigar near the dynamite shed. When uh, I was a boy, my grandfather belonged to a bohemian fraternal organization, and they had their own cemetery outside the town, but they had so little money that they couldn't afford a caretaker, so people who belonged to the organization used to volunteer to uh, sometimes dig graves. 
but mostly just take care of the grounds. And so my grandfather and father would go out there on Saturdays and mow and all that, and I'd go along with them. And there were a few stones in the cemetery that were like the traditional European stone. That is to say, they had a little oval portrait of whoever was buried there. And I happened one day to come across uh, a grave of a boy who looked somewhat like me. And it was a, quite a shock. Unfortunately, when this poem got printed in the book, they left off the second to the last line. The, the poem makes perfect sense without it, but it's a different poem. It says something else. The poem is called Caretaking at the Bohemian Cemetery Outside Oatana, Minnesota, Penultimate Line Restored. <laughs> One Saturday, a gray squirrel led me past the carved names, Patachik, Nowatni, Kubitschek, Palinka, Rishavi, Burishka, Hrdlichka, Spatenka, Krahulik, Blagik, Wenzel, while my father and grandfather mowed and clipped around the tombstones. Just where the cemetery ran into a green wall of corn, I paused at a stone. On its face was a glass oval, and inside the oval was a portrait of a boy. It was almost my own face, but I was ten years old and had outlived him by a year. I looked so long at his eyes I forgot about the squirrel, and then I gathered pine cones to lay upon his grave. Now I've forgotten his name, but I remember he died in January of 1921. The gravedigger must have cursed him silently for one full day, since a winter death meant dynamiting past the frost line and lifting out heavy blocks of earth. I stayed near him all afternoon. I think I even prayed once for him, until I heard my father calling my name through the pines, and all that evening I stayed very near him. And all that evening, it means I stayed near the boy. I really meant to say that that experience drew me closer to my father, and that poem leads into a sequence about my father's death. Another reason to have that line, but these things happen. Uh, the sequence is uh, uh, 14 poems long. I'm just going to read them a couple of the poems. Uh, this one is called A Poem to My Friends, and it's, uh, it has a kind of directness that I'm always trying to get in poems, and it isn't always easy to do. And this is toward the end of the sequence, the 12th out of 14. The moon, round as a nickel, perches a moment on the golden rain tree. It's so late, and the earth is suddenly such a still place. Nothing comes to mind but my father. As the moon lifts, I fall further and further into him. My father had friends, maybe more than enough, strong ones too, but when the earth is so still as I think of him, I see he was at heart a lonely man. If loneliness shines each night in your sky and has glowed there for as long as you remember, no friend, no matter how much light he carries, can rewrite the map of the stars. There's no blame in this. We need to know where the stars are. My friends, let me explain something now. If at times as we talk I seem to drift to a darker place, like a moon slowly eased from its orbit, it is to my father I go, or to his loneliness, which is also him. Then the next one is the second to last poem in the sequence called The One Song. And it's about this very precious uh, moment uh, when I felt a lot like I was a member of a family. <laughs> it's taken many years to find he was right that evening long ago. When the world you live in suddenly turns into a minefield and people at every step vanish into quick columns of smoke, you begin to think death is the one song. Now I know songs about the end ache in the throat only because love is there too. I must have been five years old. Black clouds were rolling across fields. 
and there were flicks of lightning on the horizon, too distant for thunder, but near enough to crackle the voice of a woman singing her heart out in the little cathedral of the radio. The song made my feet squirm. I didn't know what to do with my hands, so I put them in my pockets. Why do they only sing about love? Why always love? He laughed to my mother, then looked at me very tenderly, like I was five and a bit helpless in the head, and gave me an honest answer. What else is there to sing about? You know, I grew up on Teresa Blue, you know, great singer. They didn't play Billie Holiday on the radio in Minnesota. A few uh, translations by tech poet Holan. This uh, project occupied a year and a half of my life, during which I couldn't write my own poems because this voice was so consuming. So I just worked on this book. Uh, Holan is uh, was he died in 1980. Uh, obviously one, one of the strangest people that ever lived. He was a total recluse. He had a family. He had a daughter who was uh, retarded and uh, had some other disabilities. She didn't speak. And he lived with his wife and his mother and his daughter. And he went on living because he was afraid that if his daughter was institutionalized, they would mistreat her. And when she died, he stopped writing. He wrote his last poem just a couple of days after his daughter died. And then three years later, he died. He fell, apparently a stroke, in his apartment. I was in his apartment this summer in Prague. He there because he fell right there. You know, that kind of, okay. <laughs> and uh, he, he was a big man, a huge man. And his wife tried to get him into a bed, and she couldn't move him. And he refused to let her get any help. And he laid there for three days before he finally died. I think he knew that three days meant something. But he, uh, in Czechoslovakia, he is kind of like a, a god. You know? Everyone knows who he is, even though he was never seen on the streets or anything. He was this presence over the city. This poem is called Three of Them, and it's about the war. <clears throat> I don't think I have to explain anything. One, he isn't so old, but time and again, suffering guided the sculptor's chisel and deepened the shallow wrinkles. During the war, he was forced to be a locomotive driver in Germany survived several heavy air raids and was wounded many times by Anglo-American bombers hitting the train's boilers. Since that time, his legs have been subject to attacks of paralysis. All of a sudden, he falls down and feels ashamed. Yesterday, he says, I had to fork over 100 pounds because I fell into a crate of eggs. Believe me, not me, but my destiny had more irony than it could drink because with my defects, I got a job in a glass factory, and I either carry glass or truck it. I'm pregnant with the fear that I'll smash the glass on the unforeseeable. But when I carry something heavy, I don't fall. I usually fall when it's something lighter. I feel calm enough when I'm fishing in Troya. I also worry about table corners and all edges on furniture. I tell my wife, don't stand in front of me. Two. The other one, a machine fitter, went to Holland on German orders. I stayed there, he says, for ages. I remember the Russians best. They suffered the most. Nobody here has any idea about that. They took their shoes off and gave them to the Germans for a piece of bread. When we told them they needed the shoes, they said, we got to eat. Let's croak later, but we got to eat. That's what I remember best. Yeah, but you should have seen the invasion in Holland when the Western Allies cut the ribbon at last. All those floating dead, all those flooded villages. Then the Lineys came. I wanted to go to Russia or home, but the war was going on all the time. They didn't want 
to let me go. They wanted me to repair their tank. When I got to Prague, I had only my overalls. It was July. I've been a driver ever since. I'm 42. I've got no one here. My mom lives in Moravia. Three. The third one is a woman. This is her confession. My husband's family was from the Sudetenland. Mom went crazy running from Hitler in 38. Later, Dad got killed in an air raid in Kladno, and their son, my husband, was tortured to death by Germans during the May Revolution at Maserick Station. He worked there. But why do I tell you all this? Now they're checking all pensions for widows of those killed in the revolution, and I think it's fair because many of them have no right to get the pension. You see, for instance, that woman's husband went to get some beer and got shot. But anyway, it's terrible when they ask me what my husband held in his hand when he got killed. What can I tell them? Only that I saw him a few days after he died, and because of the smell, I could hardly step into the room where he was. Do you remember that, Keith? And anyway, we were crazy about each other. <clears throat> and ever since he's gone, I've always, I'm always worried something horrible is about to happen, worried that he'll suddenly appear in the doorway, and he did several times as a white ghost in a veil who takes a deep bow and leaves. But I still keep in touch with my Joel, and I couldn't live without him watching over me or helping me. And when I'm chopping wood, I say, how should I split this log, my love, without hitting the knot? This, uh, the next one is called Children at Christmas in 1945, and the last line of the poem is in italics, and I am quite certain that it was lifted from a piece of propaganda. It's a quote uh, directly from a, you know, a handout or something. I saw children at Christmas in 1945. They stood in front of the only stall in Charles Square and they stood in line. They were pale. They borrowed shoes from each other and breathed on the tips of fingers without nails, but they stood there patiently, humbly, grateful in advance, awaiting their turn to buy cotton candy, that sweet air, because there was nothing else for sale. And I saw a hungry boy running with a briefcase to get communion wafers at the baker's, looking forward to eating all the broken pieces at the vicarage. And I saw a mother who, in the morning, stuck ten penny nails into a sour crab apple, and in the evening gave the apple to her kids, convinced they would at least get a little iron. World, world, you bastard, what should I do with you? What should I do with you if I hear your blackmailing talk about how to safeguard peace so military intervention won't be necessary? This one's called the Vladova in 1946. The Vladova River, the Germans call it the Moldau, but the Vladova River goes through Prague and kind of meanders through the city. Uh, now there are bridges everywhere across the Moldau. Uh, years ago, they used to have ferries in some places. Uh, you know, some of the bridges go back to the year uh, 1300, 1400 or something, but there were still ferries in places. A child is standing on the bank with a heavy bag full of windfall plums and moans and cries because there's no ferry boat. It's so desperately miserable and so undernourished that its fingernails haven't begun to grow yet. And its throat looks as if it were coiled with a rope from a death bell. When you take it on the ferry, it says nothing. Its distrust is immovable. And only when it unconsciously puts its hand into the stream, it wishes the trip would last longer, gives you from time to time a resigned glance, feels like a member of the crew, feels happy, and suddenly from this happiness blurts out, I was in a concentration camp. Come on, don't lie. People refuse to believe. I swear. Don't lie. I swear, I swear, says the poor wretch, but no one believes it's true. So you take it a few times from one bank to the other and then say goodbye. But the child hesitates, and out of gratitude, as if it wanted to reward you with something jealously hidden and very precious, it says, Mister, we got little rabbits at home. He uses that 
neuter pronoun because he can't tell the sex of the child. You know, it's just a miserable creature. This one's called To the Enemy. It should be said about Holon that he stopped, uh, he, he was uh, declared an unfit writer in 1948, uh, and he stopped being published until uh, 1963 or 4, but he never stopped writing. All those years he lived in horrible poverty, kept writing. To the enemy. I've had enough of your baseness, and I haven't killed myself only because I didn't give myself life, and I still love somebody because I love myself. You may laugh, but only an eagle can attack an eagle, and only Achilles can pity wounded Hector. To be is not easy. To be a poet and a man means to be a forest without trees and to see. A scientist observes. Science can only forage for truth. Or a yes, take wing, no. Why? It's so simple, and I've said it before. Science is in probability, poetry in parables. The large cerebral hemisphere refuses the most exquisite poem by clamoring for sugar. A rooster finds rain repulsive, but that's another story. It is nice, you might say, sexually mature. And the young lady's breasts are so firm, you could easily break two glasses of schnapps on them. But that's another story. And imagine a ship's beacon, a sailing beacon, but that's an entirely different story. And your whole development from the cell of a man to the cell of a lichen, but that's an entirely different story. A cloud is going to vomit, but there's not even a gas leak at your place. You cannot be, you can't even be strangled by snake scales. What God conceives, he wants to be felt. Children and drunkards know this. But they aren't brazen enough to ask why a mirror fogs when a menstruating woman looks into it. And poets from love of life do not ask why wine moves in the barrels when she passes by. And I've had enough of your impudence that permeates everything it wanted to contain but couldn't embrace. But a holocaust will come that you couldn't have dreamed of having no dreams, what God conceived he wants to be felt. A holocaust will come. Children and drunkards know it. Joy could come about only through love if love were not passion. Happiness could come about only through love if happiness were not passion. Children and drunkards know it. In order to be, you would have to live, but you won't because you don't live, and you don't live because you don't love because you don't even love yourself, let alone your neighbor. And I've had enough of your vulgarity, and I haven't killed myself only because I didn't give myself life, and I still love somebody because I love myself. You may laugh. But only the female eagle can attack the male eagle, and only Briseis, the wounded Achilles. To be is not easy. Only shitting is easy. <laughs> uh, there's all those very dark and, and poems, and then every once in a while there are these little, little fanciful things he does, too. This one is called Like Singing. That morning, you felt like singing, and it's possible someone not very close to you danced to your singing, and being nice, danced two or three dances in spite of your awful lyrics. And the rain in the dill was very nice, too, and the sparrow was very nice, still as big as in the days of the sparrows. And that man was nice, who peddled through the drenched plum tree alley and then jumped off for no apparent reason, leaned his bike against the morgue wall, and vanished. But you went on singing. You saw a figure, not an apparition. It was an illusion, not a vision. In the deep foreground, everything was human. There was no need to fill in some missing thing, let alone to, as they say, fulfill your fate. <coughs> and yet, in a moment like that, when singing becomes the very fullness of the fullness of life, we learn suddenly that our first love got married. <coughs> this poem, one of the earliest poems I saw of Holland, who made me fall in love with it, called Snow. The 
snow began to fall at midnight. And it's true that the best place to sit is in the kitchen, even if it's the kitchen of insomnia. It's warm there. You fix some food, drink wine, and look out the window into the familiar eternity. Why should you worry whether birth and death are only two points when life is not a straight line after all? Why should you torture yourself staring at the calendar and wondering how much is at stake? And why should you admit you have no money to buy Saskia a pair of slippers? And why should you boast that you suffer more than others? Even if there were no silence on earth, that snow would have dreamed it up. You're alone. As few gestures as possible. Nothing for show. Now I'll read you the last poem he wrote called Orpheus. You know who Orpheus was. The poet. He couldn't read, write, count, but he sang. When he died, women washed his body with a sponge. When they touched his genitals, he began to sing. In terror, they fled and spread the news. He died unburied. Read some poems from this new book. These birdies sitting on, are sitting on my knees. People look at the photograph and they think it's an overlay, but these little robins are sitting on my knees. Somebody wrote to me after I sent the book to them and said, are those birds wise? And I decided my next book, I'm going to have two stuffed condors sitting on my knees. <laughs> This poem is called Inward. We look inward, and at first it is empty as a museum between exhibitions. Then we see a child staring at a blank wall, mute, who stopped asking when no one bothered to answer. In another room, an old man shuffles worn cards for solitaire, the only game in town. A woman weeps into her hands. A canary is dying of neglect. Memories gather in the corners like dust. This is why our houses have so many windows. <clears throat> I, I saw a documentary once on Channel 18 about uh, Japanese crafts. And there was a segment in there where this guy, this guy who made bells for Zen temple. And these are not little dingy dingy bells. These things are that big, you know, cast iron. And th there was this scene where they cracked this bell out of a mold. And then he rang it. And they ring it with a log on a rope, you know. That sound went on for 15 minutes, undiminished. This ringing. And I've often felt late at night that I'm hearing that bell here from way over there. <laughs> this poem is called The Bell is Struck. Night, I'm so content with you it must be I have something to hide. Three crickets are working harder than I ever did. A fourth joins with a totally new idea and the ash leaves let out their sigh. I listen. Given what I am, I've been just about as good as I can be. The moon is heavy as a temple bell where it is day now. I really listen. The bell is struck only one time, but the sound seems to gather for hours. Where it is day now, people find a way to pray. I listen to the moon. Obviously, that, you know, that bell business is just a background thing in the poem. Or something. I was thinking about it, it's not really in the poem. In a sense. But the lovely part of it was the smile on this guy's face. You know, when he heard that bell for the first time, I mean, he designed it, and when he heard it, oh, I've got 
done it again. Somebody else will read Sator and we'll figure this out. Poem called Fly Casting at Sunset. I've always liked lakes and being out on lakes and floating around until some jackass with a motorboat comes by. I like cruise, cruise being on lakes, only oars allowed. Fly casting at sunset. Right wheat runs down the hillside to where the lily pads begin. I launch the canoe and paddle through waveless water, the color of whiskey. Purple martins clear the insects from my course. I have no anchor. I shift the oar and drift. With a plier, I straighten and bend the hook on my fly until it snaps, then cast out as far as I can and wait for song. Fish just getting away at a moment like that. Uh, this poem is called I Don't Blame You, and in the back of my mind, I had a, I was thinking about a, I'll read you an, another poem which is based on, on, on a poem by this guy, Attila Joseph. Joseph, a Hungarian poet, who uh, that is just a wonderful poet, and uh, he committed suicide. What was he? Thirty-two, Peter, something like that. Early thirties, he uh, threw himself in front of a train, and uh, you know, when you read the poems, you just feel so awful that he didn't live to be one hundred and seven and do all these other poems. But then, when you read a little bit about his life, I mean, the guy had. Why, why should anybody uh, suffer such unendurable horseshit? You know, this guy, uh, he had so little money, he and his wife, they could only afford one blanket, so they used to sleep in shifts, you know, so that they could double the blanket. And she would sleep for a while, and then he would sleep. Well, of course, I mean, how long can you endure that? So, even though I don't address any particular details out of his life, I was thinking about him. I don't blame you. You listened, and you heard a woman in the next apartment crying over one potato to be divided five ways. When you looked, on your sidewalk, two little girls twirled a rope while another jumped, absentmindedly touching a blue, swollen place on her cheek. Whatever you put in your mouth tasted like your mother's ashes. Everything smelled like rust. I don't blame you for locking one by one all five of your doors. The senses shouldn't be open wounds that throb like a bad tooth when air passes over them. The worst arrived when you pulled all the shades and lay down in the dark, betrayed even by your eyelids. This uh, poem is one from which Peter quoted. Uh, it's a poem about living without any particular beliefs, which I do quite handily. I believe the stock market is unpredictable, you know, things like that, but beyond that. It's called In the Dark Again. Like a stone dropping down a well, the moon sets, and once again I'm in the dark. Oh, there's Vega and Rigel. But the trees are black, the crickets lost in the grass. I've come this far on two blind wings and no prayer, but it feels natural. It works, and I'm not where I once was. Forward is something, even if there are no high beams to make the mile markers blaze along the road. Besides, if it all had a single readable meaning, flashing like a blue beer sign, I'd keep brushing it like a moth, lightly without a thought in my head. This is the poem that is sort of based on a Attila Joseph poem. He has a poem called Attila Joseph, which is called C.G. Hanslicek. Take my word for it, Hanslicek. I love you. I can't help myself. I live with a woman who wakes to your needs and doesn't hate me for them. We can compare life to a worn shoe, a car out of gas on a back road, a lost ticket. Yet in the end, beyond the metaphors, 
we can't help loving life. It would be nice to buy a ticket to the self. It must be somewhere inside. We might arrive, though, too bored from the journey to want to see the sight. We might just lie on our back in the hotel room, counting brass spindles on the footrail of the bed, having our meals sent up, dreaming another self. My uh, wife told my daughter last night that I was going to do a poetry reading tonight. She said, well, are you going to talk about me? <laughs> She's five and she figures I'm her press agent, you know. Uh, I have a sequence of 12, 12 poems about her, about her birth and uh, the first year or so of her life, and then just some poems trying to talk to her about things she might want to think about when she's a little older. And uh, I'll read the last four from that sequence of 12. <clears throat> there you are, asleep as you enter your second year. And here I am, nearing the end of 39 of mine and counting. This little scar keeps me awake tonight. This little scar won't heal. This little scar finds a home in the wind. This this little scar says, I'm just me, all the way down. After days of dead air, I can't explain where a wind comes from at this late hour, but the poplar sways across the moon, the maple bows to an old power. I don't bend. Prune a branch here, raise a crown of leaves there, and suddenly the body seems to take on a final shape. Is that what frightens me tonight? You change each hour, even in the flow of your dreams, while I become a firm idea, flesh rings hardening, will growing beyond anyone's reach, mind dense as an oak knot. But come morning, your shriek of joy will make the wind of my heavy dreaming die down slowly. Your arms will hold my head until my limbs go slack. Could be I will change. Could be you won't even care if I'm changeless unchangeable. That's so wonderful about little kids is that they love you with, without any qualifications whatsoever. You know, you bark at them and two minutes later they're really crazy. <laughs> and it's, she's five years old and it's still happening. I have a feeling it might last until she dates. You know, I don't know. I'm not questioning it for the moment. When she was born, there was a woman in uh, a class of mine who was a winemaker, and she made a bottle of wine which had on the label to be opened on Leah's wedding day. And she handed me the bottle of wine, and I said, God, I didn't know you could keep white wine 35 years. <laughs> this is the next poem, shorter one. You've never wanted to look down, so your life is light as a midget's wing. There is something down there, and its face, too blank to read, is not our face. And its song is a heavy clack of bone against bone in the mire. We'll sit out that dance. I'm learning from you. The husk of my body is splitting. My bones lighten to seed plume. Let's raise our arms, drift, catch an updraft, and laugh in the face of gravity. The next poem is my version of uh, the afterlife. I'm, I'm telling her not to worry about it when I die because I know this is what it's going to be like. Uh, it is uh, each person gets what they want in the afterlife, and I get a pool hall. And the people I mention in here are all uh, guys who, some of them are still alive. Uh, uh, Irving Crane, Luther, Lasseter, the last three I mentioned are all still alive. The other ones are older. Irving Crane. His nickname is the Deacon, and he is, he's about six feet tall and weighs maybe 90 pounds, you know. He looks like a heron. And Luther Lasseter's nickname is Wimpy, he, and he looks like that. I, I should explain one thing in the poem. Uh, there's a game called 14-1 Continuous, which is, uh, when it comes to uh, playing pool, I'm a, a John Birch uh, conservative. 
I like green felt. You know, all these people have amber felt, red felt. Pa! That's not cool. It must be green. And the game that must be played is 14-1 uh, continuous, which is the game all the old timers play in tournament. And it's a game where uh, when 14 balls are down, there's one ball left up, you then rack 14 with no ball on the head spot. And that leftover ball is the break ball. And what you are supposed to do then is sink the break ball and break open the pack and keep going. And a tournament game is played to 150 points. And very often these guys who are really good, only one person shoots. You know, somebody gets up and does a break shot, a very conservative break shot, where the ball, two balls move to the rail and come right back to the pack. Many other guy gets up and runs 150 balls, and that's the end of that little tournament. Bostoni once in exhibition ran 460 balls in 14 one Paul Hubler is mentioned in the poem. He's a cue maker. I have one of his cues. I have the bottom of the line. I describe the top of the Hubler line in the poem because it's him. It's nothing to mourn for. I enter a room. Under the low light stands a five by ten foot table with new felt and hand carved legs. Paul Hubler is waiting and he hands me the finest cue he's ever made black linen wrap, inlays of paroba, bubinga, and palfero. It's a wand in my grasp, and I smile, and he introduces me to the archangels, Onofrio Lori, Ralph Greenleaf, Alfredo Del Oro, Irving Crane, Luther Lassiter, Willie Moscone. Someone pokes his head in the door to ask for a game of eight ball, but he is banished by a stony silence. We are serious men, and 14-1 continuous is our game. One by one, I play them. I never scratch. I never get corner hooked. I try a seven ball combination shot and the Lord says, yes. <laughs> of course I lose to Moscone, but who cares? It's a pleasure to play the man. And I have an eternity. One of these years I'll take him. We all pause for a beer at the bar, all except Lassiter, whose stomach is bad. And I tell them about my wife and daughter and they say, ah, hands look dead, you lucky bastard. And then it's back to the table. <laughs> This is the poem that closes the sequence. You're asleep. Your mother is asleep. Lifting over the ridge behind me, the full moon casts a line of light on the water all the way to the horizon. On shore, a bonfire sends up spirals of sparks. Sometime near midnight, Grunion will ride the light onto the sand. The drunks at the bonfire will rise and shout when cold water catches their ankles. Flashlight beams will frame circles of wriggling, silver-sided helplessness. Grunions aren't hooked. They're not even netted. They're just grabbed by cold hands and thrown in a bucket. I won't wait for midnight. I'll join you and your mother in sleep. I haven't a prayer now, but I'll make some wishes. May you never be helpless. If you need help, may you know where to find me. May you always trust my hands. And may my hands never hang at my side, too weak to help. Good night. And a little luck to the grunion. This poem is dedicated to our president, who is also a Contra. Isn't that nice? <laughs> Called One Humble Citizen. In the president's mind, little swords are rattling darkly, like quarters in grandfather's deep right pocket. They won't be beaten into plowshares. They won't buy a child's good and plenty for the Saturday matinee. They'll put the bones of the poor on a bus out of the city for summer camp at Lake Sleep Forever. Was my vote tallied? <laughs> After all, I'd established permanent residency on the avenue of sense between a woman's breasts. I won't move from this house as long as it has two corners, but what's one humble citizen to do? Stay in bed all day? Stop retrieving the morning paper from the rose bed? 
Lots of passion in a trunk in the attic next to grandfather's shoes. Read some love poems. What's called insomnia. A mockingbird sang to his lady all night. Now, just before sunrise, a dog barks on the next street. Inside me, it's very much the same. I sang to my lady all night, and a dog is telling me to get up and make something of my life. Work is good for you, he said. It is ennobling. Who does not work shall not eat. To hell with it. While the light tries to shudder, one more song, maybe two. Next poem called Landlock, which I was for a long time. Grew up in Minnesota, went to graduate school in Iowa. I never smelled salt water. For 24 years, I was landlocked, and since my woman is very much like the sea, some days brooding like a fog bank, other days a mirror, always a mystery in the dark, learning so much of the world by touch, often quiet, yet hiding the slow powers that reshape the rockiest coast, it's good I didn't meet her until I'd seen the ocean under both sun and moon and could understand some. I, this poem, I called up a doctor friend of mine to find out what, which colors were inside the body and was very disappointed to find out that the, the inside of the body is not a kaleidoscope. There are very few colors in there, but I did the best I could with the colors available, body and soul. There is the whisper of one shoulder against the sheet as you turn the dark. Below that whisper, I know there is a body, red chambers of the heart, white bellows of the lungs working steadily, pink viscera, kidneys, liver, and the maroon of the spleen. When I said I love you body and soul, I meant the whole body. Forgive the detail. Well, I want to read a few. Here's another poem about shooting pool with my friend John Weinberg. I have a pool table in my, my study, and uh, John and I shoot once a week anyway. Scream at each other. And we were shooting pool during an eclipse of the sun. I mean, some events are trivial, right? But the title is Annular Eclipse While Shooting Pool. For a few seconds there, the sun was slim as dead. The old ones took it as an omen. Why shouldn't we? Votive candles consume a bit of the smoke around my pool table. Burned down, the wick of one drifted to the side of the cup, and the glass exploded. Plink. Is someone shooting at me, John said, chalking his cue? Yes and no, Weinberg. Light is light. The sun is a fat candle. My desires, your desires, desires that are the dreams of our desires, are wicks. I have Diane, you have Dixie, or to grant they can't be had, we have our wick. The wick displays the flame, but wax turns into air before we know it. One day, a fat man in a dark suit will walk in on our game. It won't matter what in hell we think or feel. Big shot, fed on it. This is a poem about being a man living in a house with two women, called Family Man. 2 a.m. If I don't make my move now, my bladder's a goner. Hazily, I lift the seat, relieve myself in a rectangle of moonlight, and hazily lower the seat again. One must learn to do this without thinking to live at peace among women. <laughs> In the hallway between the two bedrooms, I pause a moment to listen. I'm at the exact center of two breathing, wife and daughter, the four lovely lungs of my life, winds from the north and south that meet to fan all my earthly fires. Poems called Good Things to Say About Death. Generally, I have nothing good to say about death. This is a little bit tongue-in-cheek. 
Of course, it must arise slowly, the emergence of form so gradual as to make seconds seem minutes, an ocean liner breaking through night fog, thousands of tiny lights winking. In those instants before it docks for good, you become an epicure of air, of cold water, the wings of a moth on the ceiling. You found an ecstatic religion based on the miracle of pollen. Your wife in a moonlit chair touches your face and her skin turns silver. As her voice, word by word, becomes the voice of another world, it's as though you are anchored and she is the one who is drifting. There are people who think you are nothing now, but oh, won't they love you, love you, love you when you're dead. I, I always tell my students not to use exclamation points. Hardly anything that you could feel justifies an exclamation point. Right? This poem is all exclamation points. It's called Great Day. Night lifts its polka dotted skirt and I rub my face against the cool thighs of dawn. Oh, what a sun we have. Feel its heat in your cupped palm. Look at its amber hairs of light of fire. This is going to be a day when flesh and spirit bury the hatchet. This is going to be a day for exclamation points. As the air warms, midges are going to swarm and bounce in a throbbing planetary dance. As the water warms, sullen brown trout are going to rise and grin and leap like midges into light. As the earth warms, corn is going to wave watery arms in the breeze and grow as pleasure grows. As my spirit warms, I am going to dance and leap into light. I am going to to mess. This is my uh, answer to uh, creationists. I just, I, you know, I look at an ape and I say, hey, bro, how's it going? <laughs> Called primitive sand. And it's based on a, there was a wood uh, when I was a kid where there was a stream bubbling up there out of sand, and you, you know, it was this wonderful feeling that you knew you could get down there on hands and knees and drink that water in absolute safety, because it was coming up to so much sand. Primitive sand. How many years had the spring bubbled its silver into that tiny pond at the stream's head? On the bottom, the sand had boiled against itself so long it was worn soft and slippery as talc. I was just a boy with a boy's knees and a boy's head, but I knew when I knelt to drink there how far that posture went back. I could as well have been an ape with my ass in the air. When I rose, <clears throat> I had the feeling I saw dimly in shade one of the old ones, the ones of the permanent frown, who forded a stream on sharp, primitive sand to become us. What a journey they made. What a stream he crossed, my dappled one, my beginning in time. I pressed my hand flat against my brow and then held the palm open towards him. It was a salute I was sure I owed him, even if he couldn't read it, even if he wasn't there. Uh, one's called The Call. One night he had a screech owl out behind the house. And then the sound the screech owl makes is not a screech at all. I don't know how they got their name. It's this wonderful yodel. Lovely. The tremolo of a screech owl sounds for an hour from the ash tree. How can such a lonely, lovely call go unanswered? I know. It happens all the time. Darkness unfurls from the east. One by one the stars ignite. The wind dies. The low call goes out. The whole world is suddenly deaf and dumb. And something else dies. Something larger than the wind. We no longer turn to the world. A murmur goes out. But the only answer that can still this tremolo of desire is one reply from one tree. Call of one. Uh, this poem is called, it 
was for this. It's another one of those canoe moments. He carried the canoe through burdocks and milkweed across a pebbly plain and silently slipped onto the lake. It was best when the water was black, bottomless. And it was for this, the broken moon falling, the last bat leaving the stars to fold itself into a shadow, the island of rock barely seen, sleeping like a skull. In an hour, the heron would shake itself awake, but for now, afloat between depths of water and sky, he was himself, most solitary, without light, most alive. This poem is called Smoke, and it's dedicated to my wife, whose father died of cancer a couple years ago. There are too many things to do in life, so our daughter's always doing two at once and pays the price in pain. Looking backward while running forward, she bangs her head on the edge of an open door. Eating while talking, she bites her tongue and yelps. She feels she didn't deserve it. The monologue was going so well. <laughs> One thing at a time, we say, but it's impossible. Focus comes with age. We are old enough to think of one thing all day long, and that has its own price. For weeks, you've thought of death collapsing like a star, growing denser and denser inside your father, absorbing a bit more of his life each day and your own darkness has been broken only in millisecond white bursts. One thing at a time. It will get darker yet, and then the milliseconds will expand into a universe of hours, perhaps uninterrupted months, with luck a year. One thing at a time, but by the time that we implode into our own black core, and the edges of us become wisps of smoke, drifting across the Sierra's ridge, we will have been many things. Children, less sure than some, but strong enough to have risen from the ashes of our parents' deaths. Parents, and despite our advice that couldn't be taken, good ones, I think, lovers, too light, too dark, into smoke, and good ones, I know. <laughs> 